so welcome everybody. I think this is a particularly uh, important subject considering the volatility here the last the last couple of days. So uh, we'll see what happens here this week, but I'm anxious to uh, see how these sentiment indicators can give us a heads up uh, and whether some of the things that we're seeing right now, which I'm going to talk about, uh, are actually play out to be uh, predictive or or whether we're going to have to make some adjustments here in the near term. The, so let me do a little bit of a introduction here as to what what is exactly do I mean by sentiment indicators because oftentimes when I say that uh, the there's kind of a perception that uh, that what happened that, that 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 a sentiment indicator is kind of a technical indicator which it is but it's a little bit different than you know a traditional technical indicator when you think about a technical indicator you you think about uh, something that's based on uh, price movement, volume over time. And uh, a sentiment indicator in the context that we're going to be using is a little bit different. And there's two specific sentiment indicators that I'm going to be talking about and a couple of variations on those. So I think you'll uh, find this interesting. By the way, uh, for those of you who would like to ask questions or uh, want to some follow-up or what have you, uh, my email address is john at pfxglobal Dot com and you're welcome to email me there if you'd like a copy of the presentation itself or uh, or whatever that would be fine um, so let's 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 jump into this particular topic uh, now I mentioned that uh, the sentiment indicators so number one here the sentiment indicators that we're going to ta be talking about are are not technical indicators so they're not they're not based on you know if a technical indicator typically is based on price movement over time sometimes including volume uh, uh, this a sentiment indicator is uh, very different in that it doesn't account for those things and in uh, one of the disadvantages that I find with uh, sentiment technical indicators or technical indicators in general and I think most traders would probably agree with this they're they're great because they're very clear and easy to use they're uh, very defined but they lag well, a sentiment indicator is something that we can look at that doesn't lag at all. Uh, it's now it's not as as defined uh, as perhaps a technical indicator is, but there are periods that it does get very specific. However, that that brings me to I think a, a very important point, and that is, uh, oftentimes I find that traders kind of deal with the market. Uh, from a binary perspective, and what I mean by that is that they look at the market from the perspective of I'm either getting sell signals or buy signals or nothing. Uh, the whereas uh, I think you'll find it's particularly long-term traders, which for those of you who've seen me present before, you know that's kind of the perspective we come from. Uh, look at uh, look at the market from the from a much more um, uh, gradient perspective. So there isn't really a binary st state. Uh, it's not either buy or sell or or, or no trade. Uh, it, there are opportunities for us to manage risk within a trade and to be able to manage a trade over the long term. So it's it's something that uh, uh, the sentiment indicators that I'm going to be talking about today are very good at doing. So it's something that um, is uh, it, it re really one of their primary purposes, I find. Now, so number two, um, largely based on option pricing variables. So for those of you who don't trade options, don't worry. This You don't have to trade options to be able to look at sentiment indicators. Um, but a lot of them are based on, on option pricing variables, and there's a reason for that, by the way. So options pricing is very interesting. You know, folks have won, li literally have won the Nobel Prize in economics for coming up with options pricing models, uh, meaning the mathematical formulas that should give you your options price. But, but no one has yet to be able to really predict with any degree of accuracy uh, what an options price should be in the open market. So uh, w I mentioned that there were a couple of people who won the Nobel Prize. They were Black and Scholes. You've probably heard of the Black-Scholes formula. Well, those were two uh, economists who won the Nobel Prize for uh, developing a formula that you could use to price options. Uh, the only problem is that, mo and most folks don't know this, they, they, they didn't win that for being able to win to, to price exchange-traded options. They, they specifically, they were looking to be able to price warrants. Uh, 
uh, which are different. So it, it's in, and obviously not typically exchange traded. So what happens is that um, there is, because options pricing is so difficult to define, there's a great deal of inefficiency in options pricing and it creates one of the one of the inefficiencies inherent in options pricing is a function called implied volatility. It's kind of the fudge factor that uh, uh, the traders insert into an options formula to get to the real price. So it's it's kind of uh, it's the fill-in number, and uh, implied volatility is a pretty critical uh, piece of options pricing. We're going to look at uh, implied volatility from a couple of perspectives. Uh, they, and by the way, uh, some of you who you may not know about implied volatility, but I'll bet you have seen implied volatility or have used implied volatility in your own trading. And we're going to look at uh, one of those uh, here in just a minute. The, the third thing I want to say is that uh, th this information is it's widely available. It's very transparent. It's free. Uh, so you can you can get access to it pretty much no matter who you are. Uh, there is some information that we're going to be looking at that's actually uh, delivered by the Federal Reserve, the New York, the New York Federal Reserve Bank, and uh, that's something that I point out to traders quite a bit actually, because not only the piece of information that we're going to be looking at is is useful, but uh, they have a lot of other information on uh, their site that I'm going to be walking through that uh, you can get access to. It's fully transparent. It's really uh, actually quite useful. Uh, uh, to uh, uh, to just be using on a daily basis. So I'll show you how to get access to that as well. Uh, the the last thing I would say is just kind of a reiteration of sentiment indicators are not just about developing trading signals. So clearly, and I'll show you some examples of this. Um, clearly, they're they, they will deliver trading signals, uh, but that's not what they're all about. It it is about risk control as well. I would take today as as a pretty good example, actually. Uh, some of the traditional trading signals that I look for uh, with the sentiment in, when I'm using the sentiment indicators are are not providing any signals today as far as entry or exit, uh, but they are providing a lot of information about risk control as to what should I be doing to hedge my portfolio uh, so I don't suffer from one of these, uh, or at least I don't suffer too p badly from one of these price shocks that we're experiencing right now. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to illustrate both of those, you know, trading signals as they've occurred in the past, as well as currently how how might I use this information uh, in the process of managing a longer term position. Okay, so there are c a couple of things we're going to be looking at, and uh, and at one point or another, I've actually talked about uh, some of these indicators uh, on their own in presentations that. But I haven't put them together, and I think that it, one of the reasons why I wanted to put them together and talk about them in one, <coughs> excuse me, in one uh, presentation today, is that it gives me an opportunity to uh, kind of show how they're related because they they are fairly related. Uh, sometimes they're just two perspectives on the same information, uh, and that can be useful. So we're going to be looking at the VIX, and I'm going to be talking about what the VIX is specifically. If you don't already know. Uh, here in just a minute because that's the first one we're going to be approaching. Uh, then we're just going to look at options volatility and specifically we're going to look at FX options volatility. So uh, what's going on with FX options and their implied volatility measures rather than uh, index implied volatility measures or market implied volatility measures. Uh, we're going to look at the Fed survey. Uh, the, the Fed does a volatility survey uh, every month and you can get access to it. It's actually quite informative. Uh, it's interesting to see uh, how traders perceive what what they or, or rather what they expect to be happening in the near term, uh, and uh, as well as the long term. You can get a lot of that information from this survey, and I'll show I'll show you how that works. Uh, it 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 can reveal a fair amount about what institutional traders are thinking in the long term. Kind of it's helpful for establishing our bias. Uh, finally, number four, we're going to be looking at the TNX and fixed income in general. We're going to be talking about flow of capital uh, because that's the TNX, while it's an index, uh, yeah, which you can, by the way, you could buy or sell options on it or what have you. Uh, it's based on the 10-year yield in the U.S. And although, although really all it's doing is just showing the inverse of bond prices uh, that are being traded uh, uh, day after day on the, in the open market, 
it's uh, it's actually a really good sentiment indicator for understanding where uh, traders are, wh where capital is flowing amongst traders. So let's let's leave the presentation here for a minute and let's go to the charts. I'm going to bring up my chart.